Our final theme in exploring the arts is the relationship between art and the spiritual. We'll be looking at Romanticism, the sublime, and the spirit in a skeptical age. Let's begin with a very human psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Okay, the spiritual. What do we mean when we're talking about the spiritual in art? Are we talking about the religious? Well, yes. Here we see Michelangelo's Pieta. It commemorates Mary's sacrifice of her son, Jesus. But is this exclusively a Christian concept? Or is it more than that? Look familiar? This is Richmond Barthes supplication or mother and son. Barthé was a sculptor of the Harlem Renaissance and here he emulates the conventional structure of the Pietà but in it he's also embodying the suffering of African-American mothers for their oppressed and often murdered sons. But he's also channeling a universal grief, human mortality. The world's first known literary poem is called the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it's the story of a half-divine king who fought heroic battles, constructed cities, made friends with a wild man, and then experienced the death of his friend as a judgment of the gods. In the epic, Gilgamesh goes on a journey through life and death. Gilgamesh is inconsolable partly because he's lost his friend, but also because he recognizes the doom of mortals. I was afraid I too would die. I grew fearful of death. Shall I not be like my dead friend and lie down never to rise again through all eternity? In the final section of the poem, Gilgamesh travels to the far away to learn the secrets of life and death from a man blessed by the gods. Oh, woe, what shall I do? Where shall I go? The snatcher has taken hold of my flesh. In my bedroom, death dwells, and wherever I set foot, there too is death. Art and spirit, life and death on the threshold of infinity. 3,600 years later, a spiritual sister of Gilgamesh, Emily Dickinson, was still seeking the human journey of trying to conceptualize mortality. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. And in this fanciful poem, Dickinson tries to imagine a consciousness passing out of the known world and looking with different eyes on the things of everyday life. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. Okay, Michelangelo, Richmond Barthé, Gilgamesh, Emily Dickinson. 
What do they share? Well, they share the spiritual dimension of art. Let's establish a definition we'll use for this final week of our class for what we mean by the spiritual dimension. Whenever art evokes a mysterious human inwardness, which yearns to transcend life and death and connect with forces of creation, we're seeing the spiritual dimension of art. Sometimes it's religious. Often it's either more or less than religious. Art is spiritual when it asks the eternal questions. What or who lies beyond what we can see and know? Where do we come from? Where will we one day go? How can we know the truth? The word apocalypse in Greek meant a lifting of the veil. And when we ask those questions, we seek light to be shed on the great human mystery. As Christians, we share with John Donne, the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, a hope of eternal life. Donne was known as a metaphysical poet of paradoxes and tropes. His holy sonnet number 10, Death Be Not Proud, is a sonnet of paradoxes in which he attempts to answer the challenge of death's apparent triumph over Christianity through the grace of Christ. Death be not proud, argues Dunn, and he works through a series of knotty, difficult paradoxes to reach this great conclusion. One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Much of the Christian art of the Middle Ages concerned itself with an apocalypse. This is a typical example of the Last Judgment, a triptych showing on the left heaven, in the center the earth on the day of Christ's judgment, and then on the right the fate of the damned. The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch also engages the same theme, heaven, earth, and hell. It's a medieval convention that arises from the sermons and paintings of the era and Dante's poetry, and it shows the damages done by sin, which in the Middle Ages were often pictured as distortions of the human body. The moral irony is that physical beauty is revealed to be hideous at its core when corrupted by sin. But this painting is quite strange. Is it, in fact, an apocalypse, or is it nightmare? Bosch's hell is a projection of his mind's hidden visions, and it seems to include the components of nightmare. We see organic forms and twisted, violated human beings, demonic animal imagery, for example, a seductive pig dressed as a nun, predatory, scavenging birds, and the corruption of the human body. Gluttony is represented as consumption and defecation. Human beauty is deformed by lust. We also see warped examples of culture, ears severed from the head as if to recognize the results of listening to the wrong things. A lute or medieval guitar used as an instrument of crucifixion. We even see technology and instrumentation as part of the punishment. These images are human, all too human. We said that the spiritual in art was a mysterious inwardness. Well, the phrase certainly seems to fit with Bosch, and we have a quotation in your book that notes that whereas other painters paint man as he appears on the outside, Bosch attempted to paint man as he is on the inside. This is a surreal self-portrait, himself as a hollow, organically deformed carapace, enclosing dark and despairing selves. 
The concepts and images of the Middle Ages often can seem grotesque or bizarre when looked at from the perspective of later ages. In the 18th century, Europe went through a period of what it called an age of reason, attempting to react against the recent past, medieval superstition, and the great violence of the 17th century in which Catholics fought Protestants and Protestants fought other Protestants. This was an age which advocated reason over passion. It discovered empirical science and it called for rational governance of self and society. Like the artists of the Renaissance, 18th century artists sought a classical Greco-Roman influence, a neoclassical style with cool, rational composition, balance, symmetry, disciplined lines, images of human ideals, elegant, beautiful surfaces. Then, the high romantics of the late 18th and 19th centuries reacted against the Age of Reason. They rejected ordered rationality of the Enlightenment as mechanical, impersonal, and artificial. They cultivated self-expression, sincerity, spontaneity, and originality, emotional directness of personal experience, the boundlessness of individual imagination and aspiration. Okay, what does this have to do with the spirit? Well, remember our definition of the spiritual in art, mysterious human inwardness, yearning to transcend life and death, and connect with forces of creation. Well, that's pretty much the definition of the romantic individual. We see the romantic imagination at work in William Blake, an English engraver and painter who illustrated his own self-published poems, which in time became recognized as some of the great poetic triumphs in the English language. Blake was a prophet of the imagination. He probed human inwardness. He reinterpreted biblical and cultural myths in order to fit his vision that human reason had to be balanced by its opposite. A dialectic of the rational and the emotional the liberation of passions which he felt had been oppressed by rationalized rules and conventions. Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell, published in 1793, attempted to embrace both sides of opposed human energies. The poem is expressed in paradoxes. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Without contraries is no progression. Attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. In another self-published and illustrated volume, Blake collected 26 paired poems, songs of innocence and experience, which, he said, showed the two contrary states of the human soul, a cheerful, graceful celebration of one of life's blessings, paired with a corresponding probing of the dark side of the same theme. The Blossom, for example, is a conventional celebration of spring's promise of life. Mary, Mary Sparrow, under leaves so green, a happy blossom sees you, swift as arrow, seek your cradle narrow near my bosom. Pretty, pretty robin, under leaves so green, a happy blossom hears you sobbing, sobbing, pretty, pretty robin, near my bosom. And yet, Sobbing, sobbing, pretty robin. What dark themes lie beneath this poem? We hear that theme in the companion poem, The Sick Rose. The triumph of a beautiful rose blossoming is haunted by the imminent death and decay. Rose, 
thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy. And his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Blake worked within a Christian framework and he drew on its themes. After all, the rose was a way that the Middle Ages referred to the Virgin Mary. But he reworked those Christian themes freely and explored universal themes of the human spirit. The fundamental human challenge, after all, is to be a consciousness living within a finite world of the physical, the known, the rational, but gazing out at the boundaries of infinity. And this leads us to the concept of the sublime. It's an aesthetic category like beauty, a pure sensory experience, but one which is disconnected from human interests and ideas. The sublime is an evocation of the transcendent. It includes images or concepts that open out beyond human experience, gateways into infinity, and the dangers intrinsic to the infinity. But it's an aesthetic danger. It's disconnected from the survival instinct. It includes a delicious stimulation of fear and apprehension, which we experience in the absence of real danger. The sublime was a fundamental concept for the artists and poets and writers of the Romantic Age. It was an aesthetic response which was completely distinct from the concept of the beautiful. It involved ideas of awe and vastness. For example, a storm at sea viewed from the safety of the shore, or perhaps in an evocative painting, or perhaps tales of horror, such as Mary Schelling's Frankenstein. In these works, we experience a delicious stimulation of fear and apprehension, but there's really no danger. Wordsworth's preface to the lyrical ballads was a romantic manifesto, and he argued that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, emotions recollected in tranquility. Well, when we think of the sublime, a storm at sea or shipwreck, as we see in this picture by Caspar David Friedrich, we experience terror, but terror recollected in safe tranquility. Light, piercing darkness, frequently evokes the sublime. In Rembrandt's Christ and the Sea of Galilee, Let's try to set aside the biblical context and simply imagine men set on a frail sailing vessel perched and vulnerable above the destructive sea. They're shrouded in the fathomless darkness of the heavens, and then they're touched by saving light. Imagine it, the universal human thrill, the borderline of life and death, and go ahead and enjoy it, you're safe. This is an aesthetic response, fear minus danger. In visual art, light often suggests the sublime in a subtly spiritual effect, an evocation of primordial human values, darkness, the mystery realm from which humans arise and to which they return, and light suggesting spiritual grace, the touch of the divine. In Rembrandt's self-portrait, we see the interplay of light and shadow. We also see Rembrandt fearlessly, remorselessly examining his own age and mortality. Rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm has found out thy bed, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Okay. Light, rose, garden, serpent, worm. These are components of myth the world over. 
The word archetype refers to symbols in dreams, rituals, and myths, which are common to diverse world cultures. They're embodiments of an essential element of universal human experience. The Swiss psychologist C.G. Jung speculated that they were residues of ancestral memory preserved in a collective unconscious. Well, I don't know if collective unconscious is convincing to you, but they certainly represent universal human experience. The suggestion of time's natural cycle, birth, death, the hope of rebirth, spiritual themes. The Romantic Age expressed itself in America in the Hudson River School of painters such as Thomas Cole, who would create enormous vistas of landscape suggesting infinite space beyond human perspective, and they would invariably use dramatic interplays of light and shadow. In F. E. Church's Cotopaxi, we see a primordial, prehistoric sublime, a Peruvian volcano and setting sun, which evoke celestial and infernal fires of creation and destruction. Last week, we spoke of the Impressionists. A step beyond Impressionism is Expressionism, as we saw in the work of Van Gogh. This is a case in which distortion and exaggeration of the image create an emotional effect. They raise the subjective feeling above objective observation, reflecting the state of mind of the artist, rather than images that conform to what we see in the external world. As we said last week, Van Gogh is projecting his own inwardness out upon the dimensions of the heavens. The early 20th century expressionism of German and Scandinavian artists such as Edvard Munch expressed a bleak, disillusioned vision, an age of skepticism, spiritual unrest, unrelieved by conventional faith. This painting, The Scream, still for many people strikes a responsive chord as they look upon it and consider their own inward selves. In the 1920s, in her apartment in Paris, Gertrude Stein coined a term for the young men who returned from World War I. She called them the Lost Generation. They were shocked and disillusioned by the horrors of trench warfare. And in general, the world seemed to be stripped of its belief in the progress of human society and of tradition. Ernest Hemingway was scarred as a child by his father's suicide. He was a journalist for the Kansas City Star, who then served as a combat ambulance driver in World War I. He became a novelist of disillusionment and despair. He was a pioneer of a stripped, terse style of writing. And he probed the existential problem, confronting human mortality recognizing how the prospect of death subverts conventional human meaning and then seeking a reason to live without illusion. In a clean, well-lighted place, Hemingway poses the spiritual problem of faithlessness. It's a bare, stripped-down story set in a cantina in Spain in which an old man answers the disillusionments of mortality with light and order. There's an internal monologue of despair. What did he fear? Not a fear or dread. It was a nothing that he knew too well. All a nothing, and a man was nothing too. There's an ironic parody of the Lord's Prayer, which replaces the familiar words with the Spanish word nada, which means nothing. And it goes on to offer a similar parody of the Hail Mary ritual. Hail, nothing, full of nothing, nothing is with thee. And in the end, 
the old man smiles and stands before a bar with a shining steam pressure coffee machine. Hemingway's story poses, but does not answer, essential human spiritual challenges. In a similar way, Richard Hopper captured the loneliness and unrest of people haunting early 20th century city streets. This painting offers its own dark spiritual vision, offering no answers. Wallace Stevens, not only a great poet, but also a vice president of an insurance company, offered a very different form of poetic disillusionment. The 20th century was an age of doubt. It offered empirical explanations of the world and cultivated skepticism. See the world as it can be seen. Strip away the distorting mythic illusions. But that left a problem that Stevens was very aware of. Human awareness is intrinsically mythic. We personify the world. And human awareness dwells in human responses and reactions. For example, consider winter's cold. Science can describe and explain what it is. But what really, speaking humanly, is cold if we don't consider the human shiver? The Snowman, written in 1923, is a reflection on the myth that survives when myths have been banished. One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow and have been cold a long time to behold the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place for the listener who listens in the snow, and nothing himself, beholds nothing that is not there, and the nothing that is. Nothing, eh? Is that the absence of a personification, or does that again invoke some personified presence? Frida Kahlo was a child of two cultures. Her father was German and her mother Mexican. She was an advocate of social justice married to the muralist Diego Rivera. Both were active communists. But she was also a painter who probed her own inwardness, quite literally. As a teenager, she was involved in a bus accident and she received numerous fractured bones, including a broken spine. She endured a lifetime full of painful surgeries. Kahlo's painting, The Two Fridas, offers a transcendent vision, multiple perspectives, at the same time, of the self. Two conflicting cultures, yes, but also the culturally determined image on the surface, and then the interiority of the body, organs, blood vessels linking the different selves. This painting, as do many other paintings by this great artist, raises spiritual questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What is inside of me? Why does my body betray me? Where am I going? Giorgio de Chirico's Mystery and Melancholy of a Street, Dark, Mysterious Menace, and the Promise of Guiding Light. Art probes all dimensions of the human heart, including the spiritual, faith and doubt, evil and righteousness, sin 
and grace, light and darkness, mortality and the hope of eternity. Art may or may not be religious, but it is always spiritual. Gerard Manley Hopkins was a Catholic priest and poet. His poetry was composed as an act of worship. God's grandeur is a sonnet of faith. The first stanza shows eruptions of God's glory in everyday life. The second provides a spiritual life, but one which is buried beneath everyday life. The third, the thematic turn, uncovers an irrepressible spiritual core at the center of all things, the Holy Spirit brooding over the world like a loving hen. As I read it, listen for the figures of speech. Can you see the images? Can you sense the parallel expressions? Hear the alliteration, the anaphora. Try to experience the whole of the poem. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge, and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things, and though the last lights off the black west went, O oh morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. Let's close with a passage from the Lamentations of Job, one of the books of Old Testament wisdom literature. Job laments his trials and those of all of humanity, the prosperity of the wicked, the elusiveness of justice, the challenge of mortality, and yet, despite the fact that he despairs and has suffered greatly, Job proclaims his faith in ringing tones. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side and my eyes shall behold, and not another. The Promise of Eternal Life